currently as a producer for a project that we're going to be introducing tonight. Um, about two years ago, I heard the Blue Avian message for the first time, and it hit me directly in the heart. Anybody else have a similar experience? Um, I think all of us are being brought together right now for various reasons, and the world is, is coming to a place where we're being brought up in a, in a higher vibration. And um, Corey here, you know, you're, you're at the front line of that, man, the front line of that. And uh, he was tasked to bring the message of the Blue Avians to a larger audience. And uh, it was probably about four months ago when he came to me with this idea for a comic book. How do you get this information to the people that um, are shut down, the people that are locked up? How many of you have family members that you would love to introduce this to, but have no, no way of doing that? When Corey said comic book at first, I kind of was like, what? And then I thought about it, and it makes sense, you know? Uh, comic books have been used going back to World War II as far as a way of disseminating information. The, the images, the combination of simple text with images, it's very much like an infographic. It lands and it plants those seeds in the subconscious. Corey's been avid about trying to find a way that is in all ages, you know, uh, platform for this message to go out. So as he talked with me more and more, this developed, and then lots of people started coming on board. We now have a, a, a very large team of uh, creative individuals, and um, what we're going to play for you tonight is the launch of the, the trailer here for Sphere Being Alliance, Return of the Guardians. Welcome, everyone. Enjoy the evening. What is their message? Their message for humanity is that we need to become more loving. We need to become forgiving of ourselves and forgiving of others. We need to focus on becoming more service to others on a daily basis, and we need to focus on raising our vibration and our consciousness. Holy crap, right? I'll just say it now. I'm Jimmy Church. I'm here to introduce Corey, Fade to Black, Coast to Coast AM. Are you guys all believers? Are you? I'm so humbled uh, to introduce Corey. I've done this a lot over the last year, uh, introducing Corey and, and David, and you guys all know that. So yeah, here I am. No big deal. But you know what? Everybody wave at me right now. That's for Corey, all right? 
All right, I'm going to keep this. Uh, we're all here to hang out with Corey, so I'm going to keep this very brief. I, I do want to say this. Uh, every time that I introduce Corey, or I bring him on the show, or we're doing interviews, I say the same thing, and I really mean this. I get emails, I get comments. Everybody knows about Corey, myself, and David's relationship, right? You guys all get that. You've all heard the interviews, right? Okay, all right, all right. Everybody says, why don't they talk more? Why aren't we getting information? Why don't they talk more? Right? And I'm like, that's all they do. <laughs> right? That's all they do is they, they're writing their, the, the websites, the web presence, the YouTube, uh, Fade to Black. They would be on Fade to Black or Coast to Coast every week. I have to book other guests. I do. But I would do that. That's, they are right there. Corey, am I wrong in saying that? Can I shut you up? Say no. That's what he wants to do. That's what he is here to do today. I am so excited. Um, please listen to everything that he has to say. It's not about to question things or to have judgment. It's to collect information and share that knowledge with your friends. We are at the brink of things. Can you guys feel this? No longer are we the strange group, man. It's the rest of the world that's tripping. Am I right? I'm going to say this right now, and I mean this. I want to introduce my good friend to you, Mr. Corey Good. Corey, get it up here. Thank you. Is this a sign? <laughs> Well, thank you for joining me. I appreciate everyone that's live streaming at home uh, joining me as well. Let me position myself. First of all, I want to thank Roger and Renee for putting all this together for me. It's outstanding. Thank you. Most of you have heard my story, and I'm going to go over it again. So, a lot of this you've already heard, but you, get, you have some eye candy to go with it this time. When I was about the age of six, I was pulled into a program that we refer to as the MyLab program. They, they identified me through standardized testing originally. Uh, come to find out that... Uh, my family had been a, has been a part of a multi-generational experiment as well. Going back to World War II, when my grandfather took part in Operation White Coat. So, uh, yeah, this was something that I was sort of born into that I found out about more, more recently. In the past, children were selected through standardized testing in public schools. Currently, not as many children are used. They're used in different, smaller programs, but for the most part, they're using clones. And um, the clones are uh, assets that they see as a little bit more disposable than the children that they were um, exploiting. They used all, all types of uh, very bizarre types of training, including sensory deprivation, putting you in deprivation chambers for hours and hours, and um, making you do visual exercises. They would also put us in very bizarre and upsetting virtual reality scenarios and see how we would react and do personality profiles and decide how they're going to use us in the future. And um, they were doing all of that to desensitize us to violence and seeing other people um, violated, which is difficult to do with children that are intuitive or empaths, but they, they were gonna, they were giving it their best effort. A lot of people hear the MK Ultra program and they like to lump everything under that. The MK Ultra program was a mind control. That's what the MK stood for. All of the other Ultra programs and 
related programs, were, were, they had different training, they had different agendas. But uh, we've pretty much been lumping everything under the MyLab umbrella since um, it's gone public. And we're all under mind control, every single one of us. We're socially programmed by the norms around us. We're programmed by television, movies, media. And um, we're, we're getting to a point to where we're starting to break free from that on an individual basis. And we're, we're utilizing the co -create, our co-creative consciousness to overcome a lot of this mind control. The, the technology isn't working the way it used to because of the change in vibration and the raising of our consciousness. They've already lost. Yeah. Many in the MyLab programs, once they're put back into their normal life, they are mind wiped, blank slated, but they exhibit symptoms of PTSD, but there's no real reason for them to have PTSD. When, um, when I was first being picked up and taken to these MyLab type programs, I found myself being slowly introduced to non-terrestrials. That you would go into like a virtual reality uh, setting where they put the goggles on you and you're sitting in the chair and it, there would be a bunch of military and medical people in the room. And then when you took the goggles off, there would be a gray alien sitting at the table. They would just spring it on you. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so they, they spent years acclimating people to being in the presence of non-terrestrials because no matter who you are, it's, you know, it's going to throw you off. You know, they, we have a, um, we're genetically programmed to respond viscerally to, these, to the, to the non-terrestrials. When I was almost 17, I was brought into the secret space program, which I'd been groomed for all throughout the MyLab program. They drafted me into uh, Solar Warden. It was my Christmas break, 1986. I was, uh, my birthday's in 11 days, so it's February 22nd. And it was during the December, just before my 17th birthday that they brought me in. They assigned me to um, a research vessel and the captain did not want me on board. In the past they had put what he called children on board and they cried for mom and it, it, took, a, it took about a year for them to acclimate and he did not want to go through that. It was too disruptive. So instead they sent me to the intruder intercept and interrogation program where we would, uh, they would use intuitive empaths to interrogate non-terrestrials that they had caught in our solar system or on Earth. When I was on, um, after, I was in that program for about a year, just under a year, and then they reassigned me back to the Sommerfeld. And um, I worked for scientists and engineers. When I was working on the science side with the scientists, they called me a specialist, and I was a technician when I was working with the engineers. <coughs> Who remembers me talking about the dart craft coming in my backyard to pick me up? Well, Rene did a pretty, pretty close depiction right here. And, uh, it was the first time I'd been taken back to the LOC since I had uh, um, been separated from the SSP program. Oh, there's the backyard. <laughs> now, in the beginning, my wife didn't know what to think when I, started, when I was telling her that a spacecraft was picking me up in the backyard. <laughs> and uh, she went in the backyard a couple times and saw little triangular spots on, you know, pod, uh, landing pad, uh, landing gear, divots. And um, one time she went out and she saw a pair of bare footprints walking out. They disappeared and about 20 feet over another pair of footprints coming back to the door. 
And that's when she started to, you know, really start to believe that something bigger was going on. Okay. The Lunar Operation Command, you notice it's shaped like a swastika. When I first went in, in around the 1987 period when I saw it, it still looked like this. When I was separated, after I left, when I was coming to get debriefed, they had purposely built around it to, to break up the look of the swastika, so it no longer looks like a swastika. This was set up by the Germans, obviously, and it was the first human base on the moon that was allowed by the other groups. The uh, moon is considered to be a neutral zone, and um, the territory is... You're not, you're not to encroach on the territory. So they finally got permission from one of the non-terrestrial groups to build in, in their area. There are at least 11 subsurface areas to this base. I, um, I was not privy to anything below the uh, hangar area, which is about three or four floors down. All right, here we go. This is what I was excited to debut. This is the 3D rendering of the base and the dark craft coming in. Not bad. So I've told the story how I was walked to the front of the auditorium at the LOC and they just walked me to the front and left me and didn't tell me what was going to happen. And when I was sitting there, the room was filled with all types of people, including military and uh, uh, people that looked like they were political. And the, the people in the front started heckling me. And in the middle of heckling me, everyone got real quiet, and you can see why. These two beings appeared behind me. It's the first time he had ever seen this golden triangle-headed being, and it was just kind of, I don't know, it's like, like it was underwater and it didn't have any bones. It was just very, it was weird. And it's on, it used its toes as tripods, and it was going up and down on those as well. And uh, so that got the attention of all of the, the people in the room, where and then they started to ask me questions, and Tear Air was answering through me. The cabal, <laughs> for the lack of a better word. The cabal is not a single group that cannot be defeated. It is a group of loosely knit materialistic syndicates. They're just criminal, criminal syndicate groups. That's all they are. They want us to build them up as an all-powerful force that cannot be defeated. That's part of the mind control. And as you are seeing, it looks like their time is done. It's becoming so obvious. Yeah. Some of the groups are real pragmatic, nuts and bolts, scientific, and they, they stick to that way of thinking. But others are very esoteric, very much into these different uh, uh, dark belief systems where, you know, they... Uh, they use sacrifice and all kinds of horrible things to uh, try to boost their magic. I think we've talked about it on um, Jimmy Church's show. Very recently, after the change of in, in administrations, the um, military-industrial complex, after some changes, started to send Marines into... Uh, some of these FEMA bases. Uh, after the change of administration, a lot of them were supposed to give up their power. Instead, they locked the doors. So the, these Marines were sent to break through all the concrete, cut through the steel, and give um, them one opportunity to surrender. And if they didn't surrender, they were to kill everyone in the entire base. And it was, uh, and these bases can, as you, as you know, hold a lot of people. These, uh, these Marines were, they were special forces, and they were not briefed on anything non-terrestrial. They just thought they were going in to clean out a bunch of um, criminals. After they had um, 
reached the base, they found themselves face to face with reptilians doing battle with them. And a lot of these uh, Marines are, you know, southern boys, you know, and uh, next thing you know, they're, they're fighting something that looks like the devil, according to their belief systems. So these guys were so incredibly traumatized, they couldn't function after this battle. This was very recently, in the last two months. Yeah, and a, a lot of other bases are being cleared out. This base, I don't know where it was located. It was a, uh, it was a unacknowledged base, so it, it wasn't one of the ones you would hear of, like the Denver airport or in the, uh, a number of the other ones. The Draco are not all powerful. They have been defeated in the past. Over the millennia, the reptilians have been kicked off of our planet. They, they come back during times of weakness, like after a cataclysm, which is what happened most recently about, about uh, 12,800 years ago. We had a huge cataclysm, which destroyed a civilization that you are familiar with, at Atlantis. And this group was keeping the reptilians in check at that time. And after they got flattened, the reptilians came back in force, and we have the mess we have now. And apparently, they are playing a negative role, their group consciousness is. When Tyrrell showed me our group consciousness, it was, it, it was pictured, it was shown to me as a person that has extreme PTSD and is somewhat schizophrenic, is, you know, it, it has been extremely traumatized. And it turns out that our superconsciousness has been in a, an abusive relationship with the superconsciousness of this reptilian group. And it's like a, a, a cosmic um, domestic violence type situation that, and, and we're both supposed to be learning something through this process. There are a number of groups that make up the Draco Federation, one of which is the, these insectoid beings. And um, they have different types you've all heard of, very ant-like beings, mantis-type beings. And uh, they genetically modify their own genome and create these um, types of other, other insectoids that some people see that have like forearms. They, they can uh, design them to do whatever they want. In the beginning, the ancient breakaway civilizations, they were kind of, uh, you know, it was just a concept. I was reading about it on the smart glass pads. And, it, you know, I got the general information that they had been making contact with us for a long time. They had been helping us after cataclysms. And um, we were considered them, uh, a lot of the people in the past considered them gods. In, in this case, the Mayan group, they, they are completely service to others. That is, uh, that, that is their mandate. Back, back when they were on Earth, they, had, they were not originally from here. They had been brought here from the Pleiades during a, a, a rough time in their star system. And they, their population grew to over 40 million people. And they disappeared because and their group came back to get them and remove them from the planet. But they did leave a contingent behind that um, had underground bases and also have bases in the Kuiper Belt. So they've been here with us the whole time. I mentioned a little bit about the acclimation process of ET contact. We have a genetic or cellular memory going way back from these beings. We're socially programmed with a fight or flight response and, gen and genetically. The ETs, they're aware of this. Some of the negative ones will exploit it, exploit us to get loose from us. And the negative ones will also appear to us as, I guess, beings of light to um, manipulate us. That's, that's why, and I, I don't want to discourage people from 
from continuing to do their, their spiritual path and, and to reach out for guides. But we do have to be careful and use a lot of, a lot of wisdom when you're, when you're communicating because the, these beings, they can present themselves as angels of light and give you great information, but just poison the well as they do. And it's happened quite a bit, and it, it confuses the people that are in real contact, and it conf confuses the information, which is the goal. So just be careful when you're reaching out. When you're, when you're fishing in the swamp, you know, you, you can catch an alligator. And, and those aren't ones you want to catch. Well, we, we have all heard Mars is a dead planet, right? Well, it's not, it's not an uninhabited planet. This is a declassified film of Camp Century. It's a top se uh, secret uh, Arctic base. And um, it was from Project Iceworm. I'm showing this because not only have they been building bases in Antarctica like this since the 50s, but this is very similar to how they built bases on the moon and Mars. They would tunnel out the ground, clear out the ground area like this, and then use lo mostly local materials, fabricated materials, to, to um, build inside. And then they would, use, uh, they would use nuclear power in the beginning. Then they graduated to where they were using thorium generators. And then now they have uh, zero point energy, so they don't, they don't have to have the more dangerous technologies. Um, I'll let this play for a few minutes and, and chime in. This is, some of you may have seen this on the internet. It was released, uh, I don't know, like a year or two ago. Now, they would ship, item, everything was prefabricated. Everything had been put together, unearthed designed to go together like a, a, a puzzle, uh, a puzzle by numbers. And I helped actually um, to, to build out an outpost on Mars. And we used a lot of the local materials on the surface after they had built below ground. And, 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 and it was very much like this. It was, it was much lower tech than you would expect. The inter Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate. We've talked about how they use slave labor. They have been in continual trade with over 900 ET species. And believe it or not, non-terrestrials from other star systems are traveling here because they love the technology we build. This advanced, there are ETs coming to trade in their used cars for cars that we built. <laughs> if that's not bizarre, I mean, I mean, that's how far ahead our breakaway civilization is. Now, they don't have money in the cosmos. It's a barter system. And they barter and trade technology and biological material. And I'll kind of leave it at that. I don't want to get too dark, but uh, it involves the human slave trade. It, with close to a million people a year. The inner Earth seems to be probably the most popular topic that I've talked about. A lot of you remember me talking about witnessing the city in the deep cavern. This is an animation that Rene created to uh, help depict it. It's very good. The only difference is the cavern was the size of a state. There's no way to really accurately depict on scale how large it was. It, unbelievable. There was mist up along the ceiling of the cave, cavern. It was, it was, it was I mean, like New York or Manhattan under the ground. Inside these pillars, natural pillars, there were, they had built in, into them. It looked like a bunch of condos. I guess that's where all the uh, um, 
uh, the, 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 uh, they don't have money. I was going to say this where all the rich people go, but they don't have money. They're, they're a fourth density being. And apparently they, they trace their lineage back to the earth. And, it, it, and some of them, including the Anshar here, back like 18 million years. Here's a new image of the Anshar library. In the Antarctica, the beginning of partial disclosure, which we want to avoid. Recently, I was brought down to the Anshar city. I was teleported and found myself in an area I hadn't been. It was a, it was a hangar bay that was full of these very large egg-shaped craft. And waiting there for me was Gonzalez, Kari, and two of the um, very quiet Asian-looking groups that have the crystal under their skin on their forehead. They all have a crystal implanted under their forehead. And um, they're very tall, they're very quiet, and they're, they have a very, very strong presence. They, they don't have to talk. And uh, I will continue with the, uh, the experience when after we got in the egg-shaped craft, they were obviously ready to go on in some sort of an expedition. They were wearing suits that looked like, sort of like chain mail. And when you, you put them on and they are activated, the chain mail just kind of, the, the threads get tighter and tighter. And it, uh, it, it, it looks like it's all one, one piece, the boots. It, the, the helmet looked kind of like what uh, people, what is, what is it called, uh, fencers, the fencing uh, helmet. It's not, not called a helmet, a mask. Yeah. In um, 19, the 1938-39 Antarctic expedition, the Nazis discovered Atlantis, and they kept it quiet. They found what we are now calling pre-Adamite ruins, and this is a group that I showed the picture of that looks like, you know, the, the pharaohs. They have the very strange um, uh, torsos. They have weird-shaped uh, narrow ribs, real wide hips. It definitely don't look like they're from around here. <laughs> uh, they, they're, the originals were 12 to 14 foot tall, extremely thin, very skinny, and when they found these bodies, they said it was obvious that they had not developed naturally on this planet. They had developed in a, on a planet with much different barometric pressure and gravity. Since these ruins have been discovered, we've all seen on the news all the different bigwigs in the cabal that have been going down and, and visiting Antarctica for many different reasons. And it's basically turned into a cabal Disneyland. They've been, what has been discovered is they've discovered three massive ships that were used to crash land on our planet. And they jokingly call them the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, because it brought this group here to Earth. We flew right through the wall and then popped out in, in a cam a cavern, a ice cavern similar to where I had been taken before. Where we landed, it was probably a football field away. They were hard at work excavating using pressurized steam to, to dig through the snow and expose some of the uh, structures. There were all types of bodies that were laying out from these pre-Adamites and their genetic experiments. There was even one... Um, it was a, a male about close to five foot tall, shorter, and uh, he was in the fetal position, and he had a tail. So this group, they, they were very big into genetic experiments, and it, from what we found there, it, it had gotten completely out of control. The, um, the bodies were not... You know it, you, how you picture the caveman just frozen and then you chip him out and reanimate him? They were in terrible shape. Their, their bodies were all contorted, arms wrapped around their bodies a few times like they had just been hit by something 
like you know a deluge of water, which froze instantly. <clears throat> After we had gone inside the library, and uh, the two, uh, and I don't have a name for them right now, uh, two Asian looking groups, they went in and immediately started removing, um, in, in the snowbank, there was obviously a corner of a building sticking out, and the suits we were wearing allowed us to walk right through the wall. And then we were inside this library this, that was full of all types of um, scrolls, bound books, and they walked right to one tray and started, and they opened up a folding um, like box and started loading it with these metal file, I mean metal uh, scrolls. And I saw one of the metal scrolls that had popped open and they had looked like laser etching on them. And they were, it, it looked, it, they, were, they were strange looking characters. And to this, I don't know why they removed them, but they obviously did not want these pre-Adamites getting access to this information. The pre-Adamites, when this deluge happened, everyone on the main continent, they were wiped out. All of the enclaves across the planet survived, and all they had with them was a the technology that they had brought with them and the knowledge to engineer. So they, they were in survival mode. We've all heard about the Mandela effect, right? Is everyone familiar with that? The, Ma the Mandela effect is just one component of this ascension that we're looking forward to. Our co-creative consciousness is, is, is interacting with time, space, and matter. And we are, we are co-creating what we're experiencing. And we have the power to co-create a positive temporal reality or a negative one. It just depends on where we, want to, where we feel like we need to be as a collective. Now, time is elastic, just like space is. And all of these paradoxes we had created by traveling back in time, we were trying to fix by going back and going back, and we're just making it worse. Then all of a sudden, these, we started realizing, and then it was confirmed from a non-terrestrial race, that these timelines were snapping back together. So, you know, we, we didn't need to, to try to fix it. it, it was, there was some sort of intelligent, intelli there's something intelligent about the way the universe was working. And it's, it baffles a lot of the scientists, but it doesn't baffle this group. Now, as I stated, ascension is going to be a co-created experience. We are creating the ascension, and we're creating it in tandem with what is happening in our galaxy. There are energetic changes going on that are undeniable, and we have to either acclimate to them or they're going to tear us apart. And that's where, you know, we see the, the good are getting better, the bad are getting worse, and I've, I've added to it, the crazy are getting crazier. They just, they can't handle the energies. No one can. Now, just about everyone is expecting some sort of a solar event. And the information goes everything from a complete 360 degree full cir circumference cr mass coronal ejection that's going to ha that they believe is going to happen. And when that happens, the sun will appear to go dark for a number of days before it pops back into equilibrium and comes back alive. And in that moment, they expect there to be a number of flashes. And a lot of this is feedback through the cosmic web from other star systems. As they are, as the energies are hitting them, the, these cosmic energies that are causing all of this change, it feeds back from star to star. And depending on where you are in the cosmic web, you're going to have this ascension event or event that helps uh, us go through a, a massive genetic and consciousness change. What Tierra has explained to me is that 
this density change that we're going to experience is almost completely a consciousness component. It is a change in consciousness. And once we have a different, broader consciousness, we realize our co-creative abilities, and then matter changes. Our bodies, the world around us changes because we change it. Yeah. That's it. Yes, Linda? The, what is, um, in different areas of the galaxy, in between, uh, as, as we rotate around the galaxy, the great year or cycle, we're, you, in, in certain open areas, there are, there are giant gas clouds, for the lack of a better word, that we've been aware of for a long time. They were sending craft out, gathering telemetry from these very hot, gaseous clouds, and taking that and, and that when, when they were taking a look at this energy that our solar system is traveling through as we travel around the galaxy, they were noticing that the people were starting to behave bizarrely. So they, took, they reproduced that energy in a controlled environment, and they found out that if negative people started to have um, sort of a breakdown. They, couldn't, they were having mental and, and emotional breakdowns. And people that were positively oriented were starting to bliss out. And, you know, they, they realized pretty quickly that as our solar system passed through this cloud, that not only was, it, was this energy going to go around the ma magnetosphere of our star and then feed in through both poles, then traveling to each of the planets where they have magnetic connections to, but that this energy feeds back throughout the entire cosmic web. And in our local stellar neighborhood, about 52 stars, we're in the very center, and there is a supergate that is just outside of our solar system that is, um, it gives you access to not only everywhere in our galaxy, but other galaxies. So it's used for travel and co co commerce by many different beings. So we're in a very coveted area of this local stellar neighborhood. It's the feedback from within the cosmic web, which I'd have to give uh, more information. I've talked about it on Cosmic Disclosure, about how um, there is a, an electric connection between each star as they're traveling, as it's spinning around the galaxy. And it's like electricity. They take the path of least resistance. That's how, that's how stargates work. You're traveling through the cosmic web. Okay, well, um, I guess that's it. We would like people to subscribe to our YouTube channels, and uh, we really want people to pay close attention to this project. We're really excited about it. As Roger said, you know, I was, I've been asked, why would you do Cosmic Disclosure, bring on all these guests to legitimize the information, and then go the route of sci-fi? And... Tier Arid basically told me that what we're doing here is a, great, is, 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 gr is a great job, but we're preaching to the choir. We need to reach out to other genres and plant these seeds in their consciousness. And if we do so, we can bump that hundredth monkey effect up to a millionth monkey effect. And we can use this medium to help to um, guide the co-creative consciousness in a more positive direction. And from the beginning, Thierry Air told me it did not matter whether people believe me or not. And he said it was of no consequence. And it was of a consequence to me, because <laughs> I was the one out there talking. But I finally realized that, you know, he was right. It's not about whether people believe me or not. It is about how they process and assimilate the information. And if, it, if the Blue Avian message can help us raise our consciousness, then we're going to be ready for this, this energetic explosion from the sun. Thank you.
Um, we got a little bit of time. Does anyone want to do a Q&A? Yeah. Do we have another mic? Awesome. You, you point me where. Yeah, how do we want to do this? Uh, I guess raise your hand and Rene will, uh, he will, well, just he'll pick whoever he wants. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, I'm wondering about, um, since the frequency has gone to um, 30, Six hertz, um, the uh, Schumann resonance. It's getting very fast. We're going very f fast through this process. And I'm wondering, uh, what do you think? You think that uh, the ascension event will come before the full disclosure? It's possible because it just jumped from two, uh, 2015 was right. 16 hertz. Before that, it was all along, they've been measuring at 7.8 hertz. Right, right, yeah, and I, there, there has been a, um, a lot of scientists will disagree that there's a change in the Schumann residence. They play with the numbers a lot, just like they do with earthquakes. <laughs> but uh, yes, the the frequency of our entire solar system is changing, and we have to have the ability to change along with it. That's why we're seeing a lot of people having a lot of triggering and mental issues and emotional issues right now. Um, you know, all, we're being forced to deal with our karma and, our, and all the things, and you may notice, all the things that you'd buried a long time ago, have they started popping up out of the blue and you're being forced to deal with them? Well, there's a reason for that. All of the emotion tied to, tied to those experiences, those emotions have density. They have, they're tangible and they're a part of you. These energies as they're passing through us, when they hit those things we haven't dealt with, those, those energetic anchors, they, they hold us back. We can't progress until we start to deal with ourselves. We have to follow the message. You don't have to change your religion, your belief system, all you have to do is, you know, start trying to forgive others. If you don't forgive others, they have the same power over you now as they did when they traumatized you. You have to forgive yourself for what you've done, and you have to focus daily on being more service to others, become more loving, and it really helps if you do get on a high vibration diet, because that is going to help you deal with these energies and be a lot in, in, a, in a more positive way. Hi. Um, I'm a little uh, curious about uh, the jobs that you had were given uh, when you entered this program. Could you um, elucidate? And also, why you're allowed to talk about this? No one's stopping. You. Well, as it turns out, there's sort of a disclosure war going on. There are factions of the Air Force that have been working with, like the NSA, DIA, and uh, some other military intelligence groups, and they have uh, a space program that they've been promised is going to be, um, you know, made public very soon, and they're excited about it. This is a uh, a program that I used to call a lower secret space program. It's lower technology, and they're told that they're the top of the pyramid, there's nothing above them, and they believe it. And if you tell them otherwise, they're, they're ready to fight you. Now, the Navy also has a much more advanced program. There's a lot of competition between the Navy and the Air Force in space. Right now, the Navy a faction of the Navy has wanted all of this to come out. Are, are y'all familiar with William Tompkins? Yes, he, it is a, what he's been doing has been a, sanctioned by a certain group within the Navy, Na Naval Intelligence. And that group is a part of the Alliance and a part of the group that had been um, encouraging me to bring information forth that was much more detailed and um, had uh, um,
talked a lot more about what was really going on out there than even the people in these Air Force programs knew about. Corey, oops, sorry. <laughs> Corey. No problem. <laughs> yeah. I, I came up with this question a year ago, but after today, I think I know your answer. But basically, are you optimistic about the eternal struggle between good and evil for the positive outcome? You say you can rephrase the question or just say yes or no. No, you're right. There, it's, we're seeing it all around us. The energetic changes, they're causing the evil people to become more evil, which ex they ex they expose themselves. They, they can't control their behavior. So they expose themselves, and as we're becoming, the, other, the good people are becoming more awake, we're, we're getting to the point where we're not going to take it anymore. And, you know, it's, it's, it's time that we get out and start demanding answers, demanding the full truth. When they come out with these partial disclosure narratives, we need to be in their face and saying, what about this, what about this? And, and make it impossible for them to uh, draw out over 50 or 100 years this, this partial disclosure narrative that they're planning on doing, which is they're going to tell us, we found Atlantis. It's amazing. And that's going to blow everybody's minds as it is. You know, a, a good portion of the planet thinks that, it, that the planet's only 7,000 years old. <laughs> so, you know, it's going, to, it's going to blow their paradigms immediately. Now... Eventually, and then after that, they're going to reveal this um, Air Force uh, DIA, NSA program that um, they have uh, two um, barely more advanced than the ISS. They have two bases up that they made out of repurposed uh, uh, rocket stages as they were launching rockets into space, uh, the lower programs. And um, they're going to reveal this, and they're going to say, oh, by the way, not only do we have this secret space program, but we've discovered these weird ruins on other planets. You know, that blows our minds again. What they've been doing in Antarctica is since, uh, for the last almost, I think, 14, almost 15 years, they've had very prestigious professors, archaeologists coming down and helping them document it. They've been videoing it, documenting it, documenting the whole process, except they're going to give us a sanitized version to where it's only humans. They've, they're removing from this, the one site that they've been filming, they've removed all the pre-Adamite bodies and the hybrids and just left the ancient humans that were working with this uh, pre-Adamite group. And then later on, they're going to discover these ships and these pre-Adamite beings. And what they had, the cabal groups had planned on doing is then saying, oh yeah, we knew about this the whole time. We're related to them. We're their bloodline. And therefore you should worship us and make us, you know, your, your leaders of, your, of the planet. And we're not going to let that happen. They're, I don't see how it's possible, but they... All of these groups have agreed that, that that is the narrative, that is what they're going to push. Corey, um, I'd like to know what your knowledge is on the uh, medical field of the um, titanium that's and implants that are being put in people for mind control. You know, I haven't heard that specifically, but they use all sorts of methods like that. Uh, they use, you, you know, they use... Uh, vaccinations for um, uh, viruses that go around, like the flu vaccine. Right. I used to work at a company, a pharmaceutical company, that produces a, a large number of, of those vaccines. And I did computer support, and I was talking to the bioengineers, and I asked them, you know, do you take these shots? And they're like, oh, no, I would never give my family these shots. <laughs> and I, was, I asked why, and they stated, there, there are all kinds of things, uh, genome, that we put in, in those things that people don't know about, including insect g genetics. So, and mercury. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. but they, they've also been putting in nanites that are inactive, and they are, they are, they're activated by a field that is turned on. Hi. 
Hi, Corey. My question is about the ascension and it relates to the law of one, which you've recently been reading. How does the density relate to the rest of us who haven't read that and what we call dimensional rising? Is there a correlation between the two or are they just kind of two separate things? Yeah, those terms get inter exchanged quite a bit. We, Tirer and Kari had both explained densities to me as that each density is just a different consciousness frequency. Uh, you know how a, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, if there's a fourth or fifth density being in the room, we would be like, you know, <laughs> where are they? Mm -hmm. no, you know, if you think about it, you have bacteria, plants, animals, you got, you know, first, second density beings that we can touch, we can interact with, they make us, some of them can make us sick. So it works the same way going up the rung, up the ladder. These, um, these beings are physical, but they've obtained such a higher level of consciousness above ours that they, at that point, they have full, almost full use of their co-creative consciousness and, and their abilities to manipulate matter and time and space. Therefore, you know, they are able to teleport and, and do things that's, that seem magical to us. Does that seem more to be the, the physical abilities? Because when we raise in dimension, what I've heard about that is becoming more service to others and not, um, not having any of the lower density or lower dimensional uh, polarities and so forth. Does that also come into play with this? Uh, at a certain point, uh, there are positive, negative duality um, d um, it within the densities going up, I believe, to fifth. I'm, I'm still learning a lot of that. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, we're trying to figure things out. You know, we're all picking up pieces off the ground, little pieces, and then grinding them together into this lens that we use to process all information. So that's where distortions come in. And all of us, all of us have distortions. And when we do get full disclosure, we're all going to be in for a shock. We're all going to have to to shift our paradigm and our belief systems to uh, the new reality. Uh, since uh, 2007, I've been keeping a, a dream journal. And many of my dreams, um, I've experienced getting training, uh, learning lessons, uh, being checked out in craft, uh, just learning how to use um, energy, um, healing, how the universe works. Um, and oh, there's always beings there, one or more beings, usually humanoid. Usually you don't see them, but I know that they're there. Uh, never any greys, never any uh, reptoids, um, usually humanoid beings that are providing these lessons, providing this training. Uh, you know, just to, those examples are just a few. Um, so I wondered if there's anybody else or you have, have come across that, and are they doing that? Yes, they're is a large confederation of benevolent beings that are trying to influence us. Um, I've been getting so many communications from people, I mean, doctors, lawyers, attorneys that do not follow this field. They start, they have an experience where they see a blue sphere. They Google and they find my information and they contact me to start asking me questions. <clears throat> what is happening is that there are so many of you out there. I'd, I'd say just about every one of you sitting down here. <clears throat> you are, you're not from here. Most of you are not from here. There are a lot of other people like us that have bought into the lie and they forgot who they were. These experiences are, re are trying to remind them of why they're here. And the... A lot of people think that Gonzalez and I are the only ones in contact with the Blue Avians. There are thousands of people out there in contact with the Blue Avians, and um, they've all been given different missions. Hi, hi, Corey. I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one, we? right here. Oh. Hi. <laughs> the first one is, um, besides doing the work on our karma and on uh, the energy and the high vibration diet, is there anything that we can physically do to prepare for the ascension? And then, and the shift in the energies, those energies. And then the second question is, what, 
what can we do to help? Is there a way to donate money? Do you have a vehicle through which we can donate money to support what you're doing and to support this whole process? And what can we do? Just let's say I, this is the first time I've heard you speak or I know anything and I walked in. What can I do to help? Yeah, I, I mean, I do take donations. I'm hopefully getting, starting to get to a place to where I will not need donations. But we are crowdfunding this campaign. And uh, our, our website, Comic Disclosure, did go live. And if people want to donate, they can there. And I'm sorry, what was the other part of your... This, the preparation is almost entirely a spiritual shift that we need to undergo. And we're, our bodies and spirit, mind and spirit, are so interconnected that on the physical level, we do need to start being careful what we're putting in our bodies, what information we're putting in our minds. There's so much negative information or tainted information out there. It's really hard right now. It, dis using discernment is, is very difficult. There's too much to discern. So this is going to be more of a spiritual type of answer than a physical one. Hello. Um, our question is about, we have two questions. Can you talk more about the alliance? Like, who are these beings? Are they humans? Are they hybrids? And are we all part of the alliance because we're here? And um, what's yours about the timeline? Oh, yeah. Is there a linear timeline as, like, how, when we're going to hit these clouds? OK. As the second question first. We have been hitting the outskirts of these clouds since at least the 1930s, if not the 1920s. So it's been going on for a long time, but we're hitting to like the thickest part of it. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? The Alliance. the Alliance, yes. Yes, anyone who is working to raise the vibration and to work for full disclosure, you're, you're the Alliance. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that they've been trying to impart onto me is that every single one of us, we have to stop looking for something to come from the sky and change everything. Those of us that are going through this change, that are awakened, you know, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones that are going to fix this and change this. No one's going to come in and do it for us. We've helped contribute to the problem. We're going to have to contribute to the solution. Hi, Corey. Uh, what, I have two things. One thing is the world's coming unglued right now. There's a lot of media bashing of Putin and Trump. And I know you guys have mentioned a couple things. I don't know if you want to share your viewpoint. If there's a lot of media lies or if there, it is a true exposure going on. And also, when you're talking about individuals being connected with, have you heard of any uh, like blue spheres being put around people? And if so, um, what would those actions be? What would be happening? Um, it, typically, in my experience, if they've put a blue sphere around someone, they're trying to shield them from something or protect them from, from something. So, so have you been aware of that happening? Yes. To people? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, it's happened to, to me like, and, and the crew okay. I was with on, on the Mars expedition. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then anything you can comment because a lot of people are coming unglued out yeah. there and it seems like, is the media like lying or uh, is it really true exposure of these people? Well, you know, there's so much propaganda from every side, in, you know, every side, even the alliance, there's a lot of propaganda with them. And, and the current president, I don't like to say Trump because so many people get triggered, you know. The current, the current president, even though he's really perplex, perplexing me on what he's doing with the environmental stuff and all that, um, he was and is backed by this alliance that is trying to bring about disclosure and get rid of this syndicate that's been running the West. Hi, Corey. Have the blue avians or anyone told you exactly how many dimensions our universe has? And would it be 11, which I, I, I could be wrong, but I think our current quantum physics says it's 11 dimensions. And could that, if in fact it is 11, 
Is that why so many people see 11-11 around or some multiple of 11? That's a good question because I see it all the time too. Um, it, it's bizarre. Um, and usually to me that just is a synchronicity that means you're on the right path. Um, now, Tier Air had told me that there is an infinite number of densities. Now, I say infinite because everything, the whole, everything is designed to return you to source. And if we're all one, and we're all, we're, we're like fragments that are all trying to return back to source, and we have to go through these densities. Now, dimensions, parallel dimensions, there are infinite t parallel dimensions. Uh, recently, Stephen Greer went on record um, saying you're a really nice guy, but... Um, but... <laughs> I'm brainwashed. Uh, yeah. yeah. That uh, the human trafficking that you talk about out there is a falsehood. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to see if you had a response to his claims. Um, on record. Yeah, you know, uh, he's had his briefings. I, I think he, a lot of his briefings have come from the, the Air Force faction. And, uh, peop, you know, he, they believe what they're telling him. And I don't see why he would have a reason to doubt them. So... You know, the, the positive, negative aliens, aliens existing, that's just a belief system. You know, we all have them. Science is a belief system. So I can't fault him for having his own beliefs because we all have our own beliefs and not everyone's going to agree with me. And, you know, there's some stuff that I'm sure I've gotten wrong that when we do get a, a disclosure event, you know, that I will see that there are some things that I, you know, I'm human. When I, the things I observed on the glass pad, that was decades ago. So, you, um, there, you know, the, I, I really don't have anything against him or, in, or any negative feelings towards him because I know that he's on his journey and doing the best he can, just like each of us are. Hi, Corey. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you've done and for risking your life to bring this forward. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. You're all going to be on my next vlog. <laughs> well, I, I think we're getting close to the end here. Um, yes. By 2026. Uh, the question uh, Linda asked was, why is Elon Musk so determined to get to Mars by 2026? There is a, a time window that they have, it's between 2018 and 2024 that they've, these different syndicate groups have used probable future technologies, uh, um, Plano um, classical physics on um, the, mechan uh, the mechanics of our solar system when they were going to reach this um, the, 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 the most energetic part of this cloud. And that's when they're expecting this flash and these events to occur is in that time window. A lot of the elites are pumping money into finding a way to get off the planet and to put um, colonies on, on other planets for a continuity of species in case something happens to the Earth. And a lot of them believe that uh, they have different beliefs about what's going to occur when the solar flash happens. Some of them believe it's just going to knock out electronics for a little while. It's going to be like uh, the, um, you know, the year 2000, the Y2K thing. It wasn't, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Others believe we're going to get hit by a giant mass coronal ejection and, and burn everything up. So the groups that believe that are um, seeding information to people that have the resources to go off planet 
to, um, to start to do a continuity of species program, which we, we've already had since the 50s and 60s. We've, we've already been creating vaults out in um, uh, a, a place that you asked me about that I said I couldn't say a whole lot about at Contact in the Desert. <laughs> I was trying to be quiet here. <laughs> There, there are uh, continuity of species vaults that, uh, that they plan on using to repopulate the planet or also uh, after they terraform Mars. So Elon Musk, his agenda, I believe, is a good one. He's wanting to, I guess, break free from the, the, the control system that wants to keep us out of space. And, and same with Virgin Space. They're trying to get out and not only set up a situation to where there would be continuity of species if an event happened on Earth, but they also are wanting to start to take advantage of the vast minerals that are out there. There are asteroids out there that are a good part, uh, like precious metals and uh, rare, what we call rare earth minerals that they can mine and and use uh, legislation has already been passed for it to protect them legally if they, um, if the, to where it's sort of like uh, any human rights violations that happen or anything, they, they won't be held uh, accountable on earth for the things that'll happen. And that, that's a law that was already passed. That's out there. Um, I can get the information on the, on the name of the law, but uh, Dr. Sala has reported on it extensively. Okay, we'll do one or two more. Let's... Okay, uh, thank you again. And I, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit, if you could, on the 20 and back program and the timelines that you saw there and compare them to what you're seeing on your second 20. Well, in, when you're in, a, in the 20 and back program, you're completely isolated from everything that's occurring on Earth. You're isolated from um, television, radio, uh, there wasn't the internet when when we traveled back uh, back then, but uh, they they do not allow you access to any information that you could use to exploit in once uh, once you've been returned to the regular timeline. So I I would not have seen anything because I was completely removed from the Earth for that time period. Well. The, back in, in the day, they used to use mainly a chemical type of blank slating. It was a, a chemical, it was, they used chemi chemi chemicals and then um, hypnosis and, you know, and program you with screen memories, uh, which are the hardest things to shake loose. Um, three to five percent of the people that they blank slate, the memories come back. And these are usually the intuitive empaths or the, or the highly sensitives. So what occurs is that you have this physical hard drive here. Well, what you're experiencing is not only stored right here, otherwise you wouldn't have memory of past lives. What occurs is that you have all this in information up in the cloud virtually. And people that, ha that are intuitive empaths or, or highly sensitives they have more of a connection to their higher self. And it's almost like if you have a hard drive die on you in, in a data center or, or something happens to where the information's removed from the hard drive, you just, it just backs up or downloads from the cloud or the backup. And this is a process that happens, um, it, it, it happens in trickles and then it, and then it, it just hits you all at once. And uh, most of it hit me within two weeks of, uh, of coming back. It started to hit me. Um, then I had a, a lot of the screen memories that, you know, like uh, originally my memory of when I was taken from my house to enter the program was that I was teleported through some sort of stargate out of my room. After I, all of the screen memories had <laughs> been broken through, I remembered I got up, walked out of my house to the front, got in a white van, and they drove me to Carswell Air Force Base. So they, they're, real, they're real, I mean, they're brilliant in how they, how they do this brainwashing and, and blank slating, and uh, they're, 
they're diabolical. I can't hear. Yes, well, a lot of the people, um, a lot of the people that have had these uh, 20 and back experiences, and a lot of scientists, they'll do six years or eight years, and they'll come back, and they've been, um, not only have they been blank slated, but they've been given screen memories that causes them to have a reaction and be the, the biggest skeptics of all, that they just won't, you know, nah, you know, that's just crazy talk. When they, they were up there serving so it, it's, um, it's different with each person how uh, you, they can't use the same type of uh, blank slating and, and mind control with each person too. They have to have a personality profile and uh, understand how the, pr it, it's, a, it's a huge process and it's a very involved process. It's you know, not just a matter of them giving you a shot, giving you a false memory and then patting you on the butt and saying go on your way. It's, it's a huge process. One more. Hi, Corey. Where are we? I'm right here. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, my question, hope it's not too silly, and it might have been answered already, but uh, it's pretty simple. It's uh, concerning what we're going through right now and all the protesting that's happening all over the country. And to me, like, I've been having mixed feelings, especially my generation's been like, a generation where they, you know, they want to stand up and they want to be heard. Yet I feel um, that the tactics of like protesting might not be the best in my, and from my perception. Right. My question to you is, what are the blue avians? What you would be your advice to this whole rising of protesting against? Something that we know it kind of has to happen and, and whatnot. Well, I do believe that there need to be protests, but I do know for a fact that the control structure right now, it's divide and conquer. And they know that the gig is up. They want us to be at each other's throats because imagine all of that passion being directed at the control structure and how quickly they would, I mean, it, it, they, it would be over. They cannot allow that to happen. So if we can redirect this passion, it would be a good thing. Yeah.